Hello, 5M, Mrs. Mills again. Um, sorry I haven't posted a couple of videos um, the last few days, but I'm actually in school this week. Um, we've got our staff room here that some of you have seen and some of you haven't, so I'm gonna give you a little sneak peek of what our staff room looks like. Um, not terribly exciting. Uh, we have our big table here that all the teachers sit around, and we have our notice board and our, where we get our coffee from and our microwave and things like that. Um, so I'm actually in the staff room um, today. We've had a few children in this week. We've all been having a little bit of fun. Um, but what I really want to do is to read you the next part of A Wrinkle in Time. Now, I found my copy at school that I have. I've actually got um, the trilogy because um, she wrote um, three books, uh, Madeleine Angle. A Wrinkle in Time, A Wind in the Door, and A Swiftly Tilting Planet. Okay. Um, so where we left off last time in the chapter, we're about halfway through chapter three. Um, so um, Meg and her mum were just having a conversation um, about what they knew already about her father, where he might be and things like that. And I think we're about to learn something um, quite important as we know that Calvin is at the house as well. And we're just learning about um, him and who he, he is as well. So um, the last few sentences we had last time we were reading was, um, I do like to understand things, Meg said. Um, we all do, but it isn't always possible. So again, I'm about eight pages before the end of the chapter, so I hope you know roughly where we are, um, and we can carry on, we can read together. Now, we might be interrupted, because a member of staff might come in to get their cup of tea or something like that at some point, um, but that's fine, I'm sure they'll wave and they'll say hello. Um, we'll see how far that we can get. Okay, right, so let's take it up from there. So, Charles Wallace understands more than the rest of us, doesn't he? Yes. Why? Well, I suppose because he's, well, because he's different, Meg. Different how? Oh, I'm not quite sure. You know yourself he's not like anybody else. No, and I wouldn't want him to be, Meg said defensively. Wanting doesn't have anything to do with it. Charles Wallace is what he is, different. You. You? Yes, that's what your father and I feel. Megan twisted her pencil so hard that it broke. She laughed. I'm sorry, I'm really not being destructive. I'm just trying to get things straight. Oh, I know. But Charles Wallace doesn't look different from anybody else. No, Meg, but people are more than just the way they look. Charles Wallace's differences aren't physical. It's in essence. Meg sighed heavily, took off her glasses and twirled them and put them back on again. Well, I know Charles Wallace is different. And I know he's something more. I guess I'll just have to accept it without understanding it. Mrs Murray smiled at her. Maybe that's really the point I was trying to put across. Yeah, Meg said dubiously. I mean, she's not so sure. Her mother smiled again. Maybe that's why our visitor last night didn't surprise me. Maybe that's why I'm able to have a, a willing suspension of disbelief because of Charles Wallace. Are uh, you like Charles, Meg asked. I? Heavens no. I'm blessed with more brains and opportunities than many people, but there's nothing about me that breaks out the ordinary mould. Your looks do, Meg said. Mrs Murray laughed. You just haven't had enough basis for comparison. That means she doesn't think she's seen enough people to compare to her. Meg, I'm very ordinary, really. Calvin O'Keefe coming in said, Ha ha! Charles all settled, Mrs Murray asked. Yes. What did you read to him? Genesis. His choice. By the way, what kind of an experiment were you working on this afternoon, Mrs Murray? Oh, something my husband and I were cooking up together. I don't want to be too far behind him when he gets back. Mother, Meg pursued, Charles says, I'm not one thing or the other, not flesh nor fowl nor good red herring. Oh, for crying out loud, Calvin said, You're Meg, aren't you? Come on, let's go for a walk. But Meg was still not satisfied. And what do you make of Calvin? She demanded of her mother. Mrs Murray laughed. I don't want to make anything of Calvin. I like him very much. I'm delighted he's found his way here. Mother, you were going to tell me about a tesseract. Yes, a troubled look came to Mrs Murray's eyes. But not now, Meg, not now. Go on out for that walk with Calvin. I'm going to go up and kiss Charles and then I'll see that the twins got to bed. Outdoors, the grass was wet with dew. The moon was halfway up and dimmed the stars for a great arc. Calvin reached out and took Meg's hand with a gesture simple and friendly as Charles Wallace's. Were you upsetting your mother, he asked gently. Well, I don't think I was, but she's upset. What about father? Calvin led Meg across the lawn. The shadows of the trees were long and twisted and there was a heavy, sweet autumnal smell to the air. Meg stumbled as the land sloped suddenly downhill, but Calvin's strong hand steadied her. They walked carefully across the twins' vegetable garden, picking their way through rows of cabbages, beets, broccoli, pumpkins, looming on their left with the tall stalks of corn. Ahead of them was a small apple orchard, 
bounded by a stone wall, and beyond this the woods through which they had walked that afternoon. Calvin led the way to a wall and then sat there, his red hair shining silver in the moonlight, his body dappled with patterns from the tangle of branches. He reached up, pulled an apple off a gnarled limb and handed it to Meg, then picked one for himself. Tell me about your father. Well, he's a physicist. Sure, we all know that. He's supposed to have let your mother and gone off with some dame. Meg jerked him up from the stone on which she was perched, but Calvin grabbed her by the wrist and pulled her back down. Hold it, kid. I didn't say anything you hadn't already heard, did I? No, Meg said, beginning to pull away. Let me go. Come on, calm down. You know it isn't true. I know it isn't true. And how anybody after one look at your mother could believe any man would leave her for another woman just shows how far jealousy will make people go, right? Well, I guess so, Meg said. But her happiness had fled and she was back in a morose of anger and resentment. Look, dope, Calvin shook her gently. I just want to get things straight, sort of out of the fact from fiction. Your father's a physicist. That's a fact. Yes. Yes. He's a PhD several times over. He's a doctor. Yes. Most of the time he works alone, but some of the time he was at the Institute of Higher Learning in Princeton. Correct? Yes. Then he did some work for the government, didn't he? Yes. You take it from there. That's all I know. Well, that's about all I know too, Meg said. Maybe Mother knows more. I don't know. What he did was, well, it was what they call classified. Top secret, you mean. That's right. And you don't even have any idea what it was about. Meg shook her head. No, not really. Just an idea because of where he was. Well, where? He was out in New Mexico for a while. We were with him there. And then he was in Florida at Cape Canaveral. And we were with him too. And then he was going to be travelling a lot. So we came here. You'd always had this house. Yes, but we used to live in it just in the summer. And you don't know where your father was sent? No, at first we got lots of letters. Mother and father always wrote to each other every day. I think mother still writes to him every night. Every once in a while the postmistress makes some kind of crack about all her letters. I suppose they think she's pursuing him or something, Calvin said rather bitterly. They can't understand plain, ordinary love when they see it. Well, go on, what happened next? Nothing happened, Meg said. That's the trouble. Well, what about your father's letters? They just stopped coming. You haven't heard anything at all? No, Meg said. Nothing. Her voice was heavy with misery. Silence fell between them, as tangible, which means she could really feel it, as the dark tree shadows that fell across their laps and now seemed to rest upon them as heavily as though they possessed a miserable, measurable weight of their own. At last, Calvin spoke in a dry, unemotional voice, not looking at Meg. Do you think he could be dead? And again, Meg leapt up and again pulled Calvin down. No, they told us if he were dead. There'd always be a telegram or something. They'd always tell you. What do they tell you? Meg choked down a sob and managed to speak over it. Oh, Calvin, Mother's tried and tried to find out. She's been down to Washington and everything, and all they'll say is that he's on a secret and dangerous mission, and she could be very proud of him, but he won't be able to, to communicate with us for a while, and they'll give us news as soon as they have it. Meg, don't get mad, but do you think maybe they don't know? Slow tears trickled down Meg's cheek. That's what I'm afraid of. Why don't you cry, Calvin asked gently. You're just crazy about your father, aren't you? Go ahead and cry, it'll do you good. Meg's voice came out trembling over tears. I cry much too much. I should be like mother. I should be able to control myself. Your mother's a completely different person. She's a lot older than you. I wish I were a different person, Meg said shakily. I hate myself. Calvin reached over and took off her glasses. Then he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket and wiped her tears. This gesture of tenderness undid her completely and she put her head down on her knees and she sobbed. Calvin sat quietly beside her and every once in a while patted her head. I'm sorry, she sobbed finally. I'm terribly sobby. Now you'll hate me. Oh, Meg, you are a moron, Calvin said. Don't you know you're the nicest thing that's happened to me in a long time? Meg raised her head. Moonlight shone on her tear-stained face. Without the glasses, her eyes were unexpectedly beautiful. If Charles Wallace is a sport, I think I'm a biological mistake. Moonlight flashed against her braces as she spoke. Now she was waiting to be contradicted, which means she was waiting for Calvin to say, oh, no, 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 that's not right. But Calvin said, do you know, this is the first time I've seen you without your glasses. I'm blind as a bat without them. I'm nearsighted like father. Well, you know what you've got? Dreambow eyes. Calvin said, listen, you go right on wearing your glasses. I don't think I want anyone else to see what gorgeous eyes you have. Meg smiled with pleasure. She could feel herself blushing and wondered if the blush would be visible in the moonlight. OK, hold it, you two, came a voice out the shadows. Charles Wallace stepped into the moonlight. I wasn't spying on you, he said quickly, and I hate to break things up, but this is it, kids, this is it. His voice quivered with excitement. This is what, Calvin asked. We're going. Going? 
Where? Meg reached out and instinctively grabbed for Calvin's hand. I don't know exactly, Charles Wallace said, but I think it's the fine father. Suddenly, two eyes seemed to spring at them out of the darkness. It was the moonlight striking on Mrs. Who's glasses. She was standing next to Charles Wallace, and how she'd managed to appear where a moment ago there had been nothing but flickering shadows in the moonlight, Meg had no idea. She heard a sound behind her and turned around. There was Mrs. Watsit scrambling over a wall. My, but I wish there were no wind, Mrs. Watsit said plaintively. It's so difficult with all these clothes. She wore her outfit the night before, rubber boots with all, and the addition of one of Mrs. Buncombe's sheets which she had draped over her. As she slid off the wall, the sheet caught on a low branch and came off. The felt hat slipped over her eyes and another branch plucked at the pink stole. Oh dear, she sighed, I shall never learn to manage. Mrs. Who wafted over to her, tiny feet scarcely touching the ground. The lenses of her glasses glittering. Oh, this bit I think is in uh, Spanish or Italian. I'll give it a go. Uh, Come to picale the fallo amoroso, Dante. What grievous pain a little fault doth forgive thee? With a claw-like hand, she pushed the hat up onto Mrs. Watson's forehead, untangled the stole from the tree, and with a deft gesture, she took the sheet and folded it. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Watson said. You're so clever. Un as no vido sabe men que un cuatro. A. Perez. An old ass knows more than a young colt. Just because you're a poultry few billion years old, poultry means little bit. Mrs. Watson was started indignantly, and with a sharp, strange voice cut in. All right, girls, this is no time for bickering. It's Mrs. Witch, Charles Wallace said. There was a faint gust of wind, the leaves shivered in it, the patterns of moonlight shifted in the circle. Something silver shimmered, quivered, and the voice said, I do not think I will materialise completely. I find it very tiring, and we have much to do. And that's the end of chapter three. So we finally then met the third lady in our um, little trio, finally met Mrs. Witch. And it sounds like they're about to go on a really exciting adventure, hopefully to find um, Meg and Charles Wallace's father and to learn more about the Tesseract. So um, I'll do a little bit more next week. Uh, until then, stay safe, stay happy, keep sharing all your lovely pictures. Um, next week, I'm also gonna do another cooking show. I'll try and get it organized a little bit better this time, let you know what we're gonna be cooking and uh, make sure it's up on time for you all to join in. Um, but hopefully we will get to hear more from you and maybe even see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.